And I love how it ties right in with what we're going to be talking about this morning. We're, we're talking about the, or singing about the cross, thinking about the wonderful things that Jesus has done for us. And this morning, we're going to be starting a study in the book of 1 John. So you can go ahead and be making your way there, 1 John, way in the back. It's on page 1015, if that helps anybody. Uh, we're going to be talking about what real fellowship looks like. What real fellowship looks like. And I really need to kind of give you a bit of a backstory to this letter that the Apostle John has written. Uh, he wrote this somewhere between 85 and 95 Anno Domini. That would be the year of our Lord. So it's first century stuff that we're dealing with. And, and he was probably in the area of Ephesus when he wrote this. Uh, so this would be Asia, as they referred to it back then in the first century. We would call it uh, the country of Turkey. It was likely circulated among all the churches right there that are on the coastland, as well as just slightly inward uh, from there. So this is a letter. Could have easily been circulated to the seven churches that he mentions in the book of Revelation that he also authored. Uh, but he's talking about some of the heresies that are infiltrating the first century church. Two specifically that are undermining who Jesus is and what he did on our behalf. And I need to just give you a little bit of a backstory of what those two things are. The first one I'm going to mention is docetism. I'm probably mispronouncing that. But it was an early Christian heresy that promoted a false view about Jesus' humanity. The word docetism comes from a Greek word that means to seem. So the underlying belief was that Jesus seemed to have a real physical body. But in actuality, he was just a phantom. It was like a ghost came down from heaven and did all the wonderful things that Jesus did and then went back to heaven. And he did not have a real, literal, physical body. Now the reason this is a major problem is because one of our Christian doctrines states that Jesus Christ was fully God, divine nature, which they would not disagree with, but he was fully man. He lived on this earth 33 and a half years, experienced the same things that you and I experienced, hunger, thirst, wrestled with temptation, although never fell to sin, and that made him this great sacrifice, this atoning sacrifice and he died on the cross for your sins, my sins, the sins of everyone who has lived before us, during us, and will come after us. He's the perfect sacrifice. They would argue he was just a phantom. He would have been in some way divine, but, divide, but denied his full humanity. And the hardcore believers of this heresy taught that Jesus was an illusion, appearing as a man, but having no body at all. He was having some sort of heavenly body, but it wasn't real. It wasn't natural flesh. And this was very similar to Gnosticism, which I will bore you with briefly. Gnosticism is really the, the big one that infiltrated the church, not only in the first century, but the second and third century as well. Gnostic, that whole word Gnosticism comes from another Greek word that means to know. And just, think, just let that sit in for a second. These guys call themselves a word that means to know. They thought they knew more than anybody else. They had some sort of special understanding from God. It didn't come from God's word because they were smarter than everybody else on the planet. Doesn't sound like anybody in our culture today, does it? I mean, if you've been watching the news, just don't watch the news right now. I'm sorry I even brought that up. Gnostics were one of the most dangerous heresies as they threatened the early church because they were influenced by philosophers like Plato, and they believed in two false premises. One, they espoused a dualism 
regarding the spirit realm and the physical realm. In other words, they were two completely different things. Your spirit was completely good in their view. The immaterial part of you was, was all good. And then all matter, the physical things in this world, were completely evil. Now just think about that for a second. That flies in the face of everything we know from God's word and his authority in our life. Because when God created everything, that includes matter, he said it was all good. It was sin that entered in through the man Adam that caused the great fall of humanity. They would argue our spirit is good, matter is bad. So in their opinion, anything they do in their physical body doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is spiritual stuff. So that gave them a license to live however they wanted to live. They thought they knew more than anybody else. They had this super understanding of God and his word, and yet they lived like heathens because in their view, the physical body doesn't matter, just the spiritual The Apostle John is writing towards the end of this first century, and he's combating these two heresies that have infiltrated the church. One says Jesus wasn't really fully human, which kind of takes away everything that he did on the cross that we were just singing about. The other says the only thing that really matters is the spiritual stuff, so you can live however you want to live. infiltrating the first century church. And here is the last remaining apostle of Jesus writing this letter, 1 John, and he's addressing these things. Let's take a look at his opening sentence, which, by the way, is our first four verses. That is a very long sentence, but let's take a look at it. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1. The Apostle John writes, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, and what we have seen with our own eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Now, he hasn't even really started this first sentence of his, and he's already taken a punch at some of these heresies. He's saying, we're going to write to you about the things that we have seen with our own eyes. We saw the Lord Jesus Christ with our own eyes. He wasn't a phantom. He was a real person. We touched him with our hands. He had a physical body. We saw him. We touched him. And it says we heard him. So he's using three different senses to fly in the face of these heresies as he addresses the problems that are going on with the first century church here. And look at what else he says in verse 1. Concerning the word of life. The Greek word there is logos, and it should immediately bring our mind to his gospel, the gospel of John chapter 1, where he just lays it out. In the beginning was the logos, the Word of God, and He was God. And that Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. And He's addressing that right here in this letter. And He calls Him the Logos of life, the Word of life. In verse 2, John says, and the life was manifested, meaning that he came down here. He became a human body, was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. The Apostle John here is talking about the divine nature of our Savior. He was with God. 
from the beginning. And then he was manifested on this earth in a physical human body. He was, he was with God and he came and walked on this planet with us. And we saw him with our own eyes. We touched him with our hands. We heard him with our ears as he taught us the things that not only he was commanding us to do, but the things that we were to go and share with others as well. So this Logos became a real human body. He was fully God and fully man. Now, I don't know about you, but my little pea brain cannot comprehend that statement. I mean, the math that I grew up with, it was if you had 100% and there were two things involved, you had to make a fraction out of it. But that's not what's going on here. Jesus was fully divine nature, fully God. And he was fully man at the same time. One of those mysteries of God that I cannot explain to you. There are other mysteries like that, where a husband and a wife will join together and become one. I cannot explain that to you. Jesus talked about he is one with the Father. While he was here ministering on this planet, he and his Father were one. He talks about he, the, whole, the Holy Spirit, and the Father being one. He talks about the bride of Christ, the church, when he comes back, the bride of Christ, and he will become one. These are mysteries of God that I cannot understand and explain to you, but I accept them by faith. I believe them. I can't explain it to you, but I believe it. That's where our faith comes in. Jesus... This book, if we really believe it, if this is the authority for our life, and we're going to take what we believe and run it through the pages of Scripture, and if it is in agreement, then I'm going to believe it. If there's something that I believe that is not in agreement with this Scripture, then I'm left in a quandary. What do I go with? My little pea brain or the authority of God's Word? And it better be that we're changing our opinion and lining it up with the authority of God's word. So he's fully God and fully man. John goes on, verse 3. What we have seen and heard, we now proclaim to you also, so that you also, or you too, may have fellowship. Now that word fellowship is a word koinonia. And it means a whole lot more than our English word fellowship. It's talking about not only a physical friendship where we're, we're spending time together and we're enjoying each other's company, but there is a spiritual dynamic to this word where we are enjoying the fellowship of each other right here in this church family. And the Holy Spirit that is in you and me is enjoying the fellowship of us being together too. There's a spiritual dynamic to this fellowship. It's koinonia. It's like when you run into a Christian that you've never met before, but you feel like you've known them your whole life. You're experiencing a little bit of this koinonia that the Apostle John is talking about. He says, I want you to have fellowship that you may have this special kind of koinonia with us. And indeed, our fellowship, our koinonia, is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We have seen and heard, and now we're proclaiming to you about this special kind of fellowship, this koinonia. And verse 4, John says, These things we write so that our joy or your joy, may be complete. And this is the opening statement of John's letter. This is one sentence in Greek. He's beginning this letter to, the, to not only the church that he originally wrote this to, but it was to be circulated with all of these churches in Asia to combat the heresies that are going on in the Christian church in the first century. And it doesn't sound so distant when you think about the things that they were wrestling with, they were wrestling with what is truth. 
Gnostics believed that, well, truth is some mystical and intuitive, subjective, inward, emotional thing that only I have a handle on because I'm smarter than everybody else on the planet. That sounds a whole lot like postmodernism to me. The, the culture we are currently living in. What is truth to these folks? It's, it's whatever they think it is because they know more than everybody else. It's a heresy that infiltrates the Christian church not only here in the first century, but right here in Leesburg in the year 2020 and beyond. It's a mindset that we will see on the streets in Walmart, wherever we go, during our day, during our week, these are the kinds of things that we're going to be running into. And if we don't understand God's holy word and have his truth, in our, not only in our mind, but in our heart, then we will not be able to interact with the culture around us and reach them with the gospel of Christ. We've been singing about it all morning. What a glorious thing that Jesus has done for us, dying on the cross for our sins. But if there is someone who believes their own truth, it leaves us in a quandary as we want to go and share the gospel with them. So first, we've kind of got to get everybody on the same level field. We've got to help folks understand what truth is, where truth comes from. And this is the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. Amen. There is no truth outside of God's word right. in Jesus Christ himself. The Apostle John goes on. Verse 5, to me, is the key that we've got to kind of land the plane on and then we can branch off from there. So please take a close look at what John is saying in verse 5 with me. John says, this is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim or announce to you, and here it is, God is light. This is the message. Now think about that. What message is John talking about? He's talking about the gospel message, the good news. Here's the good news, John says. I'm going to lay it out for you. This is what I've heard. I was walking with Jesus. I saw him. I touched him. He told me. And now I'm telling you, God is light. Now let that one sink in for a moment. God is light. Light's a funny thing. And I like science, so I may bore you with this for a minute. But in science, you learn about things that travel on wavelengths like uh, sound, radio. Okay, so, so they travel on a wavelength and they go in a straight line. So sound would go through that door into Brett's classroom. And the only way it's going to get around the corner is it's got to bounce off some glass. Because it travels in a straight line on a wavelength. If it hits the wall and you've got some kind of sound barrier in there, it's not going to penetrate the wall. I'm boring you, I can tell. <laughs> if I had perfume here and cracked open the perfume, the scent would infiltrate not only this room, but it would go around the corner into Brett's classroom, down the hall into Jim's classroom, out there where the bathroom... It goes around the corners because it's actually particles traveling through the air. Light is an odd thing because light travels on a wavelength. So it should go in a straight line. But if this place was dark and we turned on a light over here, the light would actually go around the corner into Brett's classroom and down the hallway. It travels on a wavelength like sound, but it behaves like a particle, which it is not. So what is light? It baffles scientists to this day. What is light? The Apostle John is saying, God is light. And in him, my text says, there is no darkness at all. That doesn't do justice 
to what the Greek is saying here. In the Greek language, when they want to emphasize something, they'll use a double negative. Now, in English, it negates it. If I say, there is not no darkness, that means there is darkness in English. But in Greek, that's emphatic. There's absolutely no darkness. Well, John goes one step further because he uses three negatives right here. He says, there is not no darkness, none at all. God is light. And in him, this is bad English, but good Greek, there is not no darkness, none at all. You could put a big exclamation point right there. If you remember the comedian who made noises with, ex with what, what was his name? I just lost it. Victor Borga. Oh my gosh, I love that guy. He would go right there. Good. Big exclamation point. There is not no darkness, none at all. The best I can do in English is to say there is no darkness, zip, not a zilch, zero. There is no darkness in God because he is light. Now it calls to my memory a a symbol that I've seen. It's called the yin and the yang. And if you're familiar with it, part of it's black, part of it's white. And in the white section, there's a black dot. In the dark section, there is a white dot. And the belief there is that there's good and evil. But in what's good, there's a little evil. And in what's bad, there's a little good. That does not jive with Scripture. That's correct. Amen. Amen. Because God is pure and holy, and in him there is no darkness. There's not no darkness. There's not no darkness, none at all. And the flip side of that picture is me. There's no light. Pure evil. Born into this world, a sinner in need of his redemptive change. And apart from what God has done in my life, I would be pure darkness with no light. The Apostle John says, and this is the key to understanding what he's talking about, God is light, and in him there is no darkness. Then he sets up, what I'm going to call a claim and a counterclaim. He's going to do this three times. There's a claim and a counterclaim. And he'll go through this system. Claim, counterclaim. Claim, claim. He's going to do that three times. So let's take a look at the first one in verse 6. This is what John says. Here's the claim. If we say that we have fellowship, that koinonia, with him, and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. We think we have koinonia with the Father, with our Savior, and yet we are walking in darkness. What does that mean? We are living a habitual lifestyle of sin. Now why is John bringing this up? Because these two heretics that are infiltrating the Christian church believe you can live however you want to. Only the spiritual stuff matters. Your physical body, it matters not because it, everything made of matter is evil. Do what you will. We live in a culture right here in America where people come to church, they claim to be Christian. You ever send out a survey or see someone who does and they ask people, are you a Christian? Like everybody checks yes. Where, where are these people? They're following into a similar thought pattern. I can live however I want to. It doesn't matter. John says, if you live a lifestyle of habitual sin, if you are walking in darkness, you are not having real koinonia with the Father. 
How does he say it in verse 6? We lie and do not practice the truth. We're lying to ourselves. We think we are in fellowship with the Father. We're living life the way we want to. And we're lying to ourselves and not practicing the truth. Here's the counterclaim, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, if we are walking in the light, a habitual lifestyle, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship. We have koinonia with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You see the claim and the counterclaim? We think we have koinonia with our Savior, with the Father, yet we're living a life of habitual sin. We're lying to ourselves. We're not practicing the truth. We're no better than a Gnostic who thinks they know better than everybody else on the planet and they've got everything all figured out. I've heard people say, I got a special relationship with the big guy upstairs. We got it all figured out. I'm like, sure you do. But they believe that. If you want true fellowship, true koinonia, then we live a life of walking in the light. It's a habitual pattern of walking with God in the light, not in darkness. And then look at what John says. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, we miss what's happening here in English, but the tense of this Greek word here, cleanses, is a perpetual cleansing that's happening. Jesus hung on the cross and his blood was shed on the ground. It was a one-time event thousands of years ago. And what John is saying here is that blood that was shed on that ground at that one-time event continuously cleanses you and I from our sin. It covers the sins that we have committed. It covers the sin we're committing right now, whatever we're thinking about in church right now. I'm just kidding with you. <laughs> and it's going to cover every sin that we have in the future. And not just you and me. It's going to cover everybody else's sin too. That is the action that John is saying Jesus' blood is doing. It is cleansing, perpetually cleansing us from our sin. It's a beautiful picture. This is the Savior that we were singing about. That's John's first claim and counterclaim. Let's look at the second one in verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And what's kind of buried in that word is the guilt of sin. So these people are believing that there is no guilt for their sin. They can just go on sinning. There's no guilt. And they're, again, not practicing the truth. They're just living life the way they think that they can because they're these all-knowing Gnostics. And whether they're from back then in the first century or they're right now postmoderns who believe that they understand truth. Truth is whatever truth is to them. They're living a lie. John counters that in verse 9. He says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous or just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, in the first claim and counterclaim, you kind of got the idea that you had to habitually walk in the light with God. So let me differentiate what's going on here. In the first scenario, there were people who think they could just live in habitual sin, do whatever they wanted to, and they were fine. They had their eternal fire insurance, they were headed to the proper destination, and this life didn't matter. John says, that's not true. Your habitual activity should be walking in the light. But you and I can't habitually walk in the light and never sin. You do understand that. We don't reach a place of sinless perfection 
this side of glory when we get our new body that's equipped for eternity. So we're going to have the occasional accidental sin that happens. It's not a lifestyle of sin. It's not a habitual sin, but a, an occasional accidental one. That's what he's addressing in this second claim and counterclaim. If you think that you have no guilt from the occasional accidental sin, you're wrong. John says, we're going to do that. It's going to happen. And when that happens, look at what he says. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous or just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're going to have a problem with sin. The idea is that we are being transformed through this process of sanctification. We're becoming more and more and more like Christ. Are we going to become just like Christ? No, but we're getting more and more and more like him through this process of sanctification. But along the way, along that journey, there's going to be an accidental occasional sin. And in that moment, we, can, we are to confess our sins to Christ. And he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because in that moment, our fellowship with him is broken. John is talking about this special koinonia that we're going to experience as we're walking in the light and spending time with our Savior, spending time with other believers in Christ. We're going to experience this fellowship, this koinonia. But that fellowship is broken when we sin and grieve the Holy Spirit. And the only way to restore that fellowship is to confess our sin. And then it says, He is faithful and just to forgive us and then cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not a pass to live life however we want to. We are to be actively involved in this process of sanctification. God, the Holy Spirit, His Son, they're all working together in our life, molding us into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. We will be more and more sinless, but not completely sinless. And when we sin, we are to confess it and restore that fellowship, that koinonia. John has a third claim and counterclaim. Look at verse 10 with me. As soon as I find verse 10, there it is. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. There are people on this planet who walk around and claim they have no sin. I don't have words for that. I mean, I can tell you what I'm thinking. It's not very churchy, but in my mind, I'm thinking you're an idiot. I mean, if you think you have no sin, maybe you're lost. I mean, eternally lost and on the way to hell. We have to come to a place where we recognize that we have sin and are in need of a Savior. I mean, that's kind of the ground rules to getting saved in the first place. You have to need a Savior. And the need is... I'm messed up. And if you're walking around thinking that you're not, I mean, I'm, ha I'm not having warm, fuzzy feelings about you. And I'm not talking to you guys sitting in front of me. I'm thinking about people that I have run into in the world. And that's where they are. They're living in the world. They think they've got it all figured out, and some of them think they have no sin. John is addressing that. That's obviously part of this heresy that he was combating here. And he says, you make God a liar and his word is not in you. And then he puts in this little parenthetical thing, which is the first part of chapter 2. He says, my little children. Now you have to remember, John at this point is the, is the elder. Okay, It's between 85 and 95 AD. He is the last remaining apostle. So everyone in his audience would be a child. You understand where he's coming from? Okay, this is an older fellow talking to younger folks, and he says, 
My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. That's a parenthesis in the middle of this thought right here. He's saying, you may think you have no sin, and, and I'm, I'm telling you right now, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But understand, there's going to be an occasional sin that happens. You're not going to reach sinless perfection. But at the same time, it's not a license to sin. The fact that Jesus hung on the cross and shed his blood for you is not a license for you to go on sinning. We have an obligation to be obedient. An obligation to enter into this relationship with Christ where sanctification is happening. And then John has his counterclaim. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Now, I just want to park on that word advocate for a moment. He's talking about Christ. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. The Greek word he uses right there is paraclete. You may be familiar with that. It shows up at least four times in his gospel. In John's gospel, he talks about a paraclete. The word paraclete means an advocate, an intercessor, someone who comes along beside you and helps you. And in John, the gospel of John, 14, 16, also verse 26 of the same chapter, chapter 15, verse 26, and chapter 16, verse 7, all four of those occasions, the apostle John uses the word paraclete, and he's talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the advocate. The Holy Spirit is the intercessor, the helper that comes along beside you and walks with you through life. <coughs> Excuse me. Here, he's talking about Jesus. <clears throat> paraclete <clears throat> forgive me I've been struggling with a cold here and it has just caught up to me that's okay though is water coming? that'll be helpful alright thank you Jesus okay thank you Becky Much better. Thank you. So here, Je Jesus is being referred to as the paraclete. He's the advocate, the intercessor. <clears throat> John goes on. He says, the advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. <clears throat> This word propitiation, that's a big fancy $20 word, isn't it? It's talking about an atoning sacrifice that does a couple of things. Mainly, it is warding off or satisfying the wrath of God. That's what propitiation means. So think about it. Jesus hung on the cross died for your sins and my sins, and in doing so, he satisfied the wrath of God that was looming in the background for you and for me. Amen. He satisfied that with his atoning sacrifice on the cross. <clears throat> so he made propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. I'm trying really hard to get through this. <clears throat> these last two words, we've got to hang on to these for a second. <clears throat> the word whole. That Greek word's talking about all. The, the whole, the complete. This propitiation satisfied the wrath of God, not just for you and me, not just for believers, but for all, for
for complete, the whole, and then he uses the word world. Is that you? No. Okay. And the word world here, I mean, this is already flying in the face of some theology, isn't it? The word world here in the Greek is the word cosmos. Now, sometimes that word is used for the lost people in the world. So at a minimum, we're talking about he not only died for you and me, the believers, but he also died for all of the lost people. At a minimum, that's what the Apostle John's talking about. It also means the world and everything that's created in it. And then obviously the word cosmos, it could also mean all of creation. That's the universe. Jesus hung on the cross, paid the penalty for sin, and this propitiation, Sean, I'm going to come steal a Kleenex from you. This propitiation satisfied the wrath of God just for you and me, but for the entire cosmos. Let that theology sink into your mind for a moment. Can't explain that one. That's what the Apostle John is talking about here. The entire cosmos. Jesus hung on a cross, one-time event, thousands of years ago, and that blood that was shed continues to cleanse your sin, my sin, and it is sufficient to cleanse the sins of everyone in the whole world. Amen. But there is a responsibility that you and I have, and that is to appropriate that propitiation. There, there's two $20 words for you right there, so you got your money's worth here today. We have to appropriate that. And it brings us to this place. We've got to get our theology right. Our theology about the person of Jesus Christ. He wasn't just a spook. He was a real man. He was fully divine nature and fully human at the same time. He wasn't a phantom going around performing miracles. He was all God and all man. Our theology regarding our fellowship. We've got to get that right. This whole concept of koinonia, it involves you and me being together, the Holy Spirit inside of each of us, and that special kind of fellowship that you feel when you're in the presence of other believers and the Holy Spirit is there present. We've got to get our theology right about our own sin. We can't go on living life in habitual sin. We have a responsibility to be obedient to the commands of Christ. To allow him to do this sanctifying work in our life where we become more and more like Christ and sin less and less. But in the event that we have the occasional accidental sin, we confess our sins and he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But it's not just our theology we need to get right. You know, we could think we've got it all together. We've, we've read this book. We've memorized stuff. I can, you know, beat you in a Bible trivia game. whoop de doo It doesn't mean a thing if it's just here. We have to put it into practice in our life. John is talking about living out the things that you know. I'm going to say something that sounds a little bit gruesome, but think about it. Okay, I, my observation is that many Christians are spiritually constipated. Now, let me explain what that means. They are comp they're taking information in, information in, information in. They're going to seminars, going to workshops. I mean, I'm in Bible studies all week long. I know everything. But there is no outflow of this knowledge of God. They're not living out the things that they know. Now, now you get it, right? <laughs> John is saying we are to be walking in the light, living a life of koinonia with God the Father and our Savior. 
living out the things that we know. So it's not just our theology we need to get right, it's our behavior. So today, you may, you may be here and you need to surrender your life to Christ and, and actually accept what He has done on the cross to pay for your sins, what we've been singing about and what we've been talking about all morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to get your theology right about sin, about what Jesus has done for you, about this thing we call koinonia, this special kind of fellowship that we have together. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to get your behavior right. Maybe you're here this morning and you just need to join with this group of believers so we can experience that koinonia together. Whatever the Holy Spirit is talking to you about right now, this altar is open if you want to come and pray. Whatever decision that you need to make this morning, now is the time to do that. Let's pray together.